America's first serial killer family, the Bloody Benders. Most everyone knows what they did, but who were they? Where did they go? And why did they enjoy killing so much? Stick around and you can find the answers to these questions and more on this episode of Unsolved Mysteries Soul! What do you mean, why do they enjoy killing so much? Like, they're f crazy people. Well, sometimes people have some traumas that they sort of express through the art of <laughs> uh, uh, manslaughter. Murdering and possibly eating people. <laughs> See, I wasn't the one that brought up cannibalism this time. Anyways, so. Welcome back to the show, everybody. I, again, I am your host, Cassandra Cherry, with Chad Kimmins. That's me. Yeah. Uh, doctor, doctor, I would, I doctor. gotta stress this. Uh-huh, Please because... start calling me doctor. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't spend $25,000 and like five minutes in a back alley getting my PhD to be called by my name. Uh, that's Dr. Chad Kimmins. Dr. Chad Kimmins, of course. Well then, we, we're being very proper and using our proper titles here on this episode of Unsolved Mystery Solved because we have one banger of a mystery here. I don't really have to ask you if you know about the Bloody Benders. I know it was the 1800s and they were doing their whatnots in Cherryvale, about 20 or 30 minutes north of where I grew up. And right, like, but I don't know any of the specifics. I don't even know their names or anything. So, well, I'm about to learn you a thing or two right there. All right. So, the Bloody Benders were basically a family of serial killers who lived and operated. Now, is out that of what would, is that Bloody what? Benders as in like bloody because they killed so many people, or is it bloody as oh, those Bloody Benders? You know what I'm saying. <laughs> I think it's bloody because they killed a bunch of people, mate. These are Americans, they're not exactly English people with their English speak. Dan would be so, so disappointed in our terrible British accents. <laughs> uh, he will be eventually disappointed, I'm sure, uh, whenever this comes out. <laughs> okay, so, anyways, lived and operated in what would become Cherryvale, Kansas, from uh, May of... 1871 to December of 1872. Okay. And like it says that's where they lived and operated, but they lived there for like a while longer than that. Mm -hmm. They were a bunch of uh, settlers. This was when the area was first being settled, drawn, horse and bugged, uh, horse and buggy? I think that's what they're called. Wagons. The covered right. wagons. Like boomer sooner, sooner that sort of imagery mm -hmm. right there. Like Oregon Trail type shit. Yeah, exact. And so the family consisted of John Bender, his wife Elvira, their son John Jr., and their daughter Kate. Okay. And while there's no definitive number, uh, estimates are that the Benders killed at least a dozen travelers before their crimes were discovered and they fled with their fate uncertain. Is that what, is, is, did you add that in or is that what Wikipedia said? I mean, Wikipedia does say that their fate is oh, uncertain. Okay. Anyways, going into things, the Benders came in first, husband and wife, they bought a plot of land, and they started building mm -hmm. on it. And then came son and daughter, and they built themselves like a barn, they had a garden with an orchard in it, uh, and they had a one-room building that served as both an inn and their house. Okay. And they had like a sort of canvas that cut across the middle there and separated the two spaces. Okay. Lord knows why they couldn't just build a wall, but there you go. Easier access for murder and... Oh, yeah. And apparently the people who live... Can't murder someone area, if you can't get but... through a locked door. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. And, and the canvas is very important. We'll come back to the canvas later. Okay. But the people who lived there had a lot to say about the benders. Basically... John Bender Sr. was like a 60-year-old man, and he spoke very little English. And when he did speak, it was so guttural that people really didn't understand what he was talking about. Right. Elvira Bender, who also pretty much spoke very little English, uh, was about 55 years old, and she was so unfriendly that their, her neighbors took to calling her a she-devil. <laughs> like... 
literally, when they talked about her, they described the old man as a repulsive, hideous brute without a redeeming trait, dirty, profane, and ill-tempered. And old Miss ben Mrs. Bender was a dirty old Dutch crone. Her face was a fit picture of the midnight hag that wove the spell murderous ambition about the soul of Macbeth. Apparently, people were ve very eloquent back then. So we're talking, you know, normal Southeast Kansas folk. <laughs> I know that that's only that joke is only going to make sense to anybody who has ever lived in Southeast Kansas. And I'm pretty sure we don't have a whole lot of Southeast Kansas listeners. But trust me, it's a f hilarious joke. <laughs> oh, no. I know my best friend Lou listens to the podcast. He'll get it. Oh. That one's for you, Logan. <laughs> Okay, so on to John Jr. John Bender Jr. John, right, John Jacob Jingle Hammerschmidt. Yeah, uh, who lived on Drury Lane. Wait, that's not the right thing. Anyways, he was about 25 years old, and he was described as being handsome with auburn hair and a moustache. Oh, so this guy is not from Southeast Kansas. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Apparently he didn't take after his parents, <laughs> if they even were his parents. Dun dun dun. A little bit of foreshadowing there. Dun dun dun. Can't you tell from the music? <laughs> I'm gonna have to put but... in some f foreshadowing music <laughs> now. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but he spoke English fluently with a German accent, and he was prone to laughing at random times. And that led to people describing him as a excited, grave-robbing hyena. Where did the grave-robbing come from? <laughs> I don't know. It just says, Young Bender, seen when excited, recalled the grave-robbing hyena at once to mind. Hold on. That's what it says. I, I gotta look this up. Oh, okay. What? So I think it's just grave-robbing hyena is just a turn of phrase. Because hyenas are uh, uh, scavengers. Yeah. They eat dead leftovers and whatnot, so that's where they're... I thought they meant, like, he was a literal grave robber, but nobody's seen him do this, and they're just like, you know what? That guy, I bet he digs up graves. Why do you say that? Oh, just look at him. He's just got that look. I mean, really. And I mean, he may not have dug up graves but he certainly did dig graves he don't look like us he looks he don't look like he's from here so he must be weird i bet he robs graves <laughs> he's one of them gingers i hear they don't have a soul that's why he's robbing graves trying yeah, to yeah one of them dare gingers trying to steal a soul. trying to steal souls from the dead yeah that leaves us with Kate Bender being the last, who was about 23, and she was cultivated and attractive and spoke English very well with a very little accent. And she was a self-proclaimed healer and psychic. The Benders brought with them to this area spiritualism which was sort of like a, like the wiki describes it as a religion, but it's more like old age, new age, like the sort of snake oil, ah, I will see your future in right. the crystal ball sort of thing. Right. But she, Kate, said that she had supernatural powers and the ability to cure illnesses. And she gave a lot of lectures on spiritualism and that attracted, along with the fact that she was very attractive, a lot of people to their end. I mean, if they're killing people, those people aren't ill anymore. So she's not I mean... technically wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in some ways, in some ways. But yeah. So also, pe uh, there was a thing in town with the people who knew the Benders mm. that although it was said that Kate and John Jr. were brother and sister, a lot of people were like, no, they're married. Partially because she was very open about her carnal relations with her brother. I mean, why not both? <laughs> yeah. Apparently, Kate was uh, recorded as saying, Shall we confine ourselves to a single love and deny our natures their proper sway? Even though it be a brother's passion for his own sister, I say... It should not be smothered so. Okay, now we're back in Southeast Kansas territory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking more Arkansas, but <laughs> it's right in there. Uh, for some reason, I was Arkansas. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know anybody from my home area. You don't know anyone from your home? I don't know anybody from my home area that was into incest, but it's also like super illegal. 
So people tend to keep it under wraps when they're doing it. So the Bender fan family set up their farm. They had a real small inn that they uh, were operating. And they were just living sort of normal lives like everyone else, even if everyone was like, yeah, those guys are really freaking weird. We don't like the adults. <laughs> and I mean, even the kids are suspect, but whatever. I mean, the one robs graves. The other one claims she can heal people, but I'm pretty sure she's just murdering everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Somebody in the back's like, shh, 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 shh. You're getting ahead of the storyteller. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, pretty much, right there, right there, right there. Although we do pretty much know how it goes. Right, the, the mystery here isn't what they were doing, it's what the f*** happened to them. Exactly, but so, a lot of people disappeared normally in the West, just because that's what it was. It right. was coyotes, wolves, Native American conflict. Dysentery, if Oregon Trail has taught me anything. Falling <laughs> off cliffs, into ravines, the whole shebang. I mean, like... If you don't have somebody die of dysentery in Oregon Trail within the first, like, ten minutes, are you really f***ing playing the game, right? I mean, honestly. <laughs> you're supposed to die before you reach the first river. I mean, but... I don't think that's the object of the game, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're supposed to reach Oregon. <laughs> so, no one really knew why there were more people disappearing in Labette County than mm -hmm. anywhere else. It was just, you know... Labette County. Yeah, it was starting to make people avoid the area more than anything. All they really heard was rumors. Right. They were our rivals in high school for football. Oh, really? That's why nice. That's why I was like, F*** that county. <laughs> Fair enough. But the first sort of indication that something was up was in May of 1871. The body of a man named Jones was found in Drum Creek with his skull crushed and his throat cut open. And the owner of Drum Creek was uh, suspected, but nothing was done about it. Who who was suspected? Sorry, I missed that part. Uh, the owner of Drum Creek. Oh, okay. The person who owned that plot of land. Okay. He was suspected, but nothing was done about it. Okay. And in February, about a year later, the bodies of two more men were found that had the same injuries as Jones. And by 1873, it was so common that everyone was like, yeah, yeah, you don't go there. You just don't go there. One in four people are turning up with their skull crushed in. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And so it didn't really travel outside of that area until in March of 1873, where a well-known physician from Independence, Kansas, named Dr. William York. Dr. York arrived on the train at Cherryvale mm -hmm. and then just seeming, seemingly disappeared. Okay. But he had two very powerful brothers who were very determined to figure out what happened to their little brother. And that was Colonel Edward York and Kansas Senator Alexander York. Okay. So they got the attention of a senator. Right. Colonel York led the investigation in Labette County. He went down there himself and he's like, all right, everyone, what's going on over here? And when questioned, the benders denied any knowledge of it, even though they were like the inn in town. Right. And they're just like, ah know what you're talking about. I mean, he left and everything. But apparently, mob ender, Elvira, flew into a violent passion when asked about a report that Colonel York had gotten about a woman who had been threatened with pistols and knives at their inn. And she was just like, ah, bah, that woman, she was a witch who cursed our coffee. And she ordered the men to leave her house. The coffee. What? Yeah, oh. uh, apparently she cursed her coffee. She's a witch, I tell you. Oh, ah. man. But that was also the first time that she really revealed that her sense of the English language was much better than she let on. Right. So. I can't get, I can't get over the cursing the coffee thing. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, like, how would you even curse the coffee? Like, do you just cuss at it? Is that what she did? I hope your coffee is darker than you like it! <laughs> you putting some cream in there? Well, it's spoiled! <laughs> oh, no. That's, like, literally the worst, though. Ugh. Spoiled coffee. And there are grounds in it! <laughs> grounds I can live with. Oh, I hate... Grounds I can live with. I hate grounds in my yeah. coffee. Yeah, it's, it's not a nice texture. But at least they're, like, edible. But uh, before York left their inn, 
Kate asked him to return alone the following Friday night, and she would use her clairvoyance to help him find his brother. You know, the way a murderer totally would help you find your brother. Did she instead use her healing powers to heal him of the illness of being alive? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. I mean, the, great, the greatest illness that every single human on the planet has is that we're all going to die someday. So, you know, mm -hmm. to heal that illness, just kill him. Yeah, and that may be what she was planning on, but... At around the same time, the township held a meeting in, uh, the Harmony Grove Schoolhouse, and both of the male benders were in attendance. Mm -hmm. And so, the townsfolk were talking about this, the colonel was laying out his case, and the townsfolk decided they would search every homestead for evidence of the missing brother. But the weather turned bad, and it would be several days before the search could begin. Okay. Now... So, which I mean, that's it was long. That's pretty fair. I like you, you yeah. live in the Midwest too, so you understand that one minute it's nice and the next, oh my god, it's fucking snowing in July. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> What's the tornado doing here? It was sunny just a moment ago. Oh, now I can't bring in the laundry. <laughs> like, seriously, it's, it's it's gone off to Oz. People who live in really cold temperatures think they have it bad. And people who live in really hot temperatures think they have it bad. And then us here, like, smack dab in the middle of the country are like, you think it's bad? Really? Okay. Well, try having, like, 20 degree weather one day, and then the next it's 95, and you can't figure out how to dress when you go to work. Anyways, so, coming back to the story after the inclement weather, uh, three days after the township meeting happened, this guy named Billy Toll was driving cattle past the Bender property, and he noticed that the inn looked abandoned, and there were, like, starving farm animals wandering about, mm -hmm. just, un just completely unfed, just totally abandoned. Right. He reported it to the township trustee, but they couldn't get out there to investigate for several more days because the weather was not stopping. And when they finally got around to investigating it, they found it was completely empty. The benders had fled for the hills. There were about several hundred volunteers, apparently, who arrived to search the grounds. Mm -hmm. And they noted that while the wagon was gone, little else had been taken except for food and clothing. Okay. Though the house was empty, everything else seemed normal, until someone noticed a really vile or odor. And they followed that odor to a trap door that was under one of the beds that had been nailed shut. Okay. They pried that puppy open. I've seen enough horror stuff to know that you never pry open nailed shut trap doors, I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't think they really had a, a cinema back then. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying. You, you I never know, open. I know. They hadn't... If there's a foul odor coming from the trap door, you set the house on fire and you walk away. That's it. Yeah, just <laughs> just assume it's an animatronic and leave. <laughs> nah, they, they pried that puppy open, they went in there, and it led to a cellar that was drenched in blood. Like, it was so drenched that the odor had seeped into the soil. And so the volunteers broke the foundation of the house and dug, but they didn't find anything. Okay. And then people turned and they looked and they're like, you know, the garden always seemed freshly plowed. Want to go check out the garden? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> and so they go out into the garden and the orchard and they start digging. And the very first thing that they unearthed was baby brother York's body. The back of his head had been smashed. His throat slit. And soon enough, they found more bodies with similar injuries. Eight bodies in seven of the nine graves. And one in a well with several body parts. Almost all of them were men. Killed the same way and quote unquote indecently mutilated. Is there a decent way to mutilate a corpse? I think by indecently mutilated, they're being timesy for saying their dicks and balls were messed with. Okay. That's fair. Like, like, like indecently as in, like, some they did something down there. Uh, okay, that's fair. Yeah. They, w they wouldn't describe it because they were good proper Christians, but... So, there was only one female corpse. 
And her murder had been different. The only one out of them that was reported as being different. Mm. And either she was strangled or buried alive. So I'd I'd rather just slip my throat and bash my head in, please. Yeah, because that's an awful way to go. So initial estimates uh, from the site had them hovering at around a dozen bodies, but in all they may have committed about 21 murders. So kind of like the torso murderer. (laughs) We've got a bit of a leap here. A few bodies over here, a couple bodies over there, you know. We gotta count for, like, the different body parts in the well. We know he killed, do they think, killed 12 people. But we suspect yeah. they might have killed at least 100. <laughs> Where well, is I this mean, other number coming from? Ah, oh, we're just wildly speculating. Guessing, based off of disappearances and stuff. Because, I mean, they found... My wife went missing. She's standing right there. He bashes her in the head. My wife's dead now. Must have been those dirty f- Benders. Must have been those dirty f- bloody benders. Those bloody benders. Oh, are you getting irritated so, with me interrupting yet? <laughs> no, not at all. Because, like, that's just the flow of the show, you know? So, basically, the way their modus operandi went was this. It's believed that guests at the inn were sometimes urged to sit against the separating curtain at a place of honor, and while dining, they'd be hit on the back of the head with a hammer from behind the curtain. Right. Their body would then be dumped into the trap door to the cellar, where one of the benders would slit their throat before stripping the body of all its valuables. This has a real Sweeney Todd vibe. Yeah, it does. It even has, like, the trap door and everything. Were they serving the other patrons of the inn meat pies made of <laughs> past murders? No one said a thing about that, sadly. <laughs> sadly? <laughs> I was really hoping that this would get even more gruesome, (laughs) but... It would be interesting, (laughs) though, wouldn't it? But yeah, I looked and no one made any mention of cannibalism. And apparently most of the bodies, most of them, were buried intact. Okay. It was just the ones in in the well that were kind of chopped up, and we don't know why. But this sort of version of events of what would happen was corroborated by several people who lived in the area. Mm -hmm. Uh, one man, a Mr. Wetzel, uh, remembered a time where he'd been at the inn and he declined an offer to sit in that designated spot near the curtain. And because of that, Ma Bender had gotten so angry and abusive toward him, and then he saw the male benders coming from behind the cloth and he and his companion decided to leap. Hold up. So this guy, these guys, these, these two people, Yeah. they... Feared for their life and left. Yeah. But didn't f- tell anybody, hey, you might want to check them people out. There's some weird shit going on. They tried to kill us. Apparently not. Like Evil prevails when good <laughs> men do nothing. <laughs> exactly. And like, there was a traveler named William Pickering who told an almost identical story, except when he refused to sit there because of the weird stains on the cloth, Kate threatened him with a knife. Again. He fled the press. Why didn't yeah. you go tell someone and be like I don't know. They were being really pushy about me sitting in this one seat. The cloth was stained. I'm pretty sure it's blood now that I think about it. They threatened me with a knife. Maybe go check yeah. these f- out. Yeah, a Catholic priest also claimed to have seen one of the Bender men concealing a large hammer, at which he became uncomfortable and departed. And uh yeah. So that was corroborated by several people. And more than a dozen bullet holes were also found in the roof and sides of the cabin. So, the vic- some of the victims might have tried to fight back after getting hit. This, whatever. No, I'm just no. Continue. I'm just. Continue. It angers me. I know. <laughs> you're like <laughs> it's you're funny. Like, I know. I like it when you get pissed off because it provides good, funny podcasting. Um, exactly. <laughs> No, it just pisses me off that these people all, like, suspected something was up, and not a goddamn one of them said anything. Yeah, no one did anything until a colonel and a senator got involved. And then they rounded up a posse. Like, a several hundred person posse. Somebody tries to kill me, or I suspect that they might have wanted to kill me, and I'm gonna go to the cops and be like, look, I know you can't do anything, maybe, but you could, like, maybe swing by, check this place out, out. like, that... uh, Yeah, is this the Old West or not? (sighs) Jesus. Anyway. Uh, But yeah. Anyway. So, this is the part where the mystery comes in. Mm -hmm. Senator York offered a $1,000 reward. 
and the governor of the state chipped in another 2,000. But the reward was never claimed. And so several groups of vigilantes were formed to go after the benders. And there were a whole lot of stories. Like, one group said that they caught all the benders and shot all of them but Kate, whom they burned alive as a witch. Another group claimed that they'd caught the benders and lynched them before throwing their bodies in uh, the Verdigris River. Uh, yeah, you got it right, Verdigris. Verdigris, great, I have words. And yet another group claimed that they killed the benders with during a gunfight and buried their bodies on the prairie. But no one brought back enough proof to claim the reward, which... Turns out there were actually like 50... Benders and all of these people actually killed like a family of four of them or something. Oh gosh. <laughs> I mean, maybe. I mean, maybe. We'll get there. But like, think of like the $3,000 reward in 2020 money. That's like $64,000. Right. That's the equivalence there. So the fact that no one actually got to claim the reward is very sad. So. Well, you know, and the fact that they were never caught. True. <laughs> we'll see where your priorities are at. <laughs> I mean, it's good money. <laughs> but, I mean, I think they, I think, I think most of them got caught or died. We'll get there. But, uh, detectives following the wagon tracks discovered the Bender's wagon mm -hmm. was abandoned with a starving team of horses and one of the mares lame about 12 miles out of uh, where their inn was, just outside the city limits of Thayer. Okay. But probably they were driving their wagon in the, like, sheeting rain at, like, a breakneck pace and uh, took a corner too fast or something and hurt one of their mares and just, like, booked it and then hoofed it the rest of the way on foot. But in there, the family bought tickets on uh, the Leavenworth, Lawrence, and Galveston Railroad for Humboldt. But apparently at Chanute, John Jr. and Kate left the train and caught the MK and T, T, MK and T train south to the terminus in Red River County near Denison, Texas. Okay. And from there, uh, apparently investigators trailed them to an outlaw county thought to be in the border region between Texas and New Mexico. And they didn't go any further because they didn't want to die. Right. Ma and Pa Bender, uh, Elvira and John Sr., right. didn't leave the train at Humboldt, but continued to Kansas City. And there it's thought they purchased tix tickets for St. Louis, Missouri, but no one ultimately knows. Okay. And so that's where the trail sort of lets off, but also there's conflicting reports about which groups of them went with whom based off of later arrests. Okay. So that, that was the initial investigation. Gotcha. But uh, they were having a hard time tracking these people because apparently none of the Benders were actually named Bender. Right. And the only people who were probably even related were uh, Elvira and her daughter Kate. Pa, according to a Bible they found, was reportedly born as John Flickinger in either Germany or the Netherlands. And Ma was said to have been born Elmira Maik, M-E-I-K, or Mark, okay. I guess would be the uh, Americanized version. And she had a husband named Griffith, with whom she had 12 children. And she married several other times before marrying Pa, and each husband before him reportedly died of head wounds. Huh. So she's been at this a while. Yeah. Quite a while. Oh yeah, quite a while. Her daughter Kate was apparently born Eliza Griffith, but we're not sure. And John Bender Jr.'s real name was apparently John Gebhardt. Okay. And so, who knows where that came Yeah, I, from. I did know that Elvira and Kate were married. Were married. Were... Elvira and Kate were married? Is that her name, Elvira? I, I know, I, I, I said yeah, married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's not what I meant. Were the mother and the daughter married no, to each no, other? No, no, I meant to say we're related. Because that's what that sounded like. I said married, I meant to say we're related. Um, I know. I did know that they were mother-daughter, and that the rest yeah. of them, or they had no real relation to the other two. Ew, it's complicated. 
like, what, a, like, how even. But in 1884, mm -hmm. there was some report that John Flickinger had committed suicide in Lake Michigan. Okay. There was a description of an elderly man matching John's description who was arrested for murder in Salmon, Idaho, uh, where the victim had been killed by a hammer blow to a head. Right. And a message requesting, like, identification was sent to Cherryvale, but the suspect severed his foot to escape his leg irons and bled to death. Jesus. Yeah. And by the time a deputy arrived, he was impossible to identify because he would decompose so much. Right. So, what happened to John Flickinger? Did he commit suicide? Did he cut off his leg and die in Idaho? Who knows? And then, in October 31st of 1888, no, 1889, it was reported that a Mrs. Almira Monroe, aka Mrs. Almira Griffith, and a Mrs. Sarah Eliza Davis mm -hmm. had been arrested in Niles, Michigan. Okay. For larceny. <laughs> And they were released after being found not guilty, but then were re-arrested for the Bender murders. <laughs> and, yeah, and so it went crazy. Sarah Eliza was accusing Mrs. Griffith of being Ma Bender, and Mrs. Griffith was like, I'm not Bender, but, but she's Kate. Obviously, she's Kate Bender. At which point the cops go, so both of you knew, <laughs> supposedly, that you were traveling with a f serial killer and you said nothing yeah that seems likely i mean <laughs> yeah really well she said she'd kill me oh, but... yeah honestly uh the women's identities were later confirmed by two osage township witnesses uh from a tintype osage osage oh you're fine i'm just this, there's just very rare that I know how to pronounce the towns and shit because and this they're is one all of those in times. The, yeah they're all in the state that I live in so but the the women's identities were confirmed by two Osage County town uh, township witnesses from a tintype photograph the deputy sheriff Leroy Dick <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> just. Leroy Dick. <laughs> I love that you were like you I can tell you were expecting a bigger like laugh out of that. No. I just Yes, you were. You were like Leroy Dick. <laughs> get did, it? Like I a did, penis. <laughs> I didn't read it. And I didn't really register his name until I said it and then I was like hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Uh but <laughs> Aren't I funny <laughs> making dick jokes? Hey, I'm the same. Sorry. Like, one of the first times I ever got really, really drunk, I was trying to DM. And... Oh, honey. <laughs> and, like, most of my friends had already gone home at that point, but there was a scene that I needed to do with the two people who had left behind. And they were getting a reward for, like, a bounty that they'd collected. And... The guy was bringing him a heavy sack of gold, and I read that from the description. I was like, <laughs> heavy sack. <laughs> and I just bust out laughing, and I couldn't stop. And eventually I calmed down, and I was like, okay, where was I? Uh, you said heavy sack, and I bust out laughing again, and that's when we <laughs> knew I was drunk. <laughs> oh my god. I'm the kind of person who laughs way too much at stupid little jokes like that. <laughs> So, Leroy Dick. <laughs> Come on, keep it together. <laughs> You're not even drunk, I think. I'm not. <laughs> I was just trying to get you back on track. I wasn't like trying to make you laugh again because you didn't seem to remember where you where you were at in the notes. I found it. You had you had just mentioned Leroy, whose name I whose last name will go unmentioned. Okay. okay. <laughs> Again, this should be a 20 minute episode and we're over an hour now. <laughs> Sorry. I shouldn't be laughing. No, it's fine. Okay. I'm just fine with you. I don't really give a shit. Uh, I ain't got shit to do tonight. But, anyways, mid October. Deputy Sheriff Leroy Dick, who had headed the search of the Bender property, arrived in Michigan and arrested the couple on October 30th mm -hmm. after their release on larceny. And so Mrs. Monroe, a.k.a. Uh, the original Eliza Bender, was like, you'll never take me alive! 
that she. She said like three f- names now. I mean, yeah. Well, no, <laughs> like you've called her three different things and not not aliases because originally it was El- Elmira or something like that. Yeah, Elmira. And then I said something about Elvira, and you were like, yeah, Elvira. And then just now you called her Eliza. I mean, it should have been Elvira. Eliza's her daughter, apparently, in this case. The names are too similar. I think they had a theme. So, is her name Elmira, or is it Elvira, her real name? I think her real name is Elmira. Okay. And that she chose Elvira for her pseudonym as a bender. Okay. I think that's how that works. When I edit, I'll... I'll figure out what it is, and I'll I'll make it make sense. (laughs) Yeah, it's so confusing. But, yeah. So, apparently, another one of her daughters came in and was like, Yep, that's my mom, and yep, that's my sister, and yep, they're the benders. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, they murdered a bunch of people. And she's like, no, no, you're not my daughter. Who are you? (laughs) Apparently, the trial was a mess. Right. I can imagine. Yeah, but apparently... With the way that the trial went, the judge, Judge Calvin, found that the, uh, all these affidavits that were being brought in were sufficient proof that the women could never be convicted and discharged them both. Oh my god. Yeah, so uh, all the documents are missing from the file in Labette County, so no one can like examine it further. And after that, we lose the trail of those two women. So we're, we're almost done with the like the the storytelling portion here but as sort of like a an aside several weeks after the bodies were originally discovered addison roach and his son son son-in-law william buxton who were neighbors were arrested as accessories to the crime and 12 other men in like not other men but 12 men in total of quote unquote bad repute in general were arrested including another friend of the Benders named Brockman, who had been originally hung and released from the hanging three times while the initial gang of volunteers interrogated him. So were these people like convicted or were they just arrested on suspicion? It says that they were uh, arrested. Uh, the 12 okay. of them were arrested. Uh, but apparently all of them had been involved in disposing of the victim's stolen goods with a man named Mitt Cherry, a member of the Vigilance Committee in the area, implicated for forging a letter from one of the victims to inform the victim's wife that he had arrived safely at his destination in Illinois. Okay, so they were they were arrested kind of like as accessories because they knew what was going on and they were acting as fences. Yeah, it was sort of a conspiracy. Okay. Gotcha. But they didn't do any of the killing. No, those guys don't okay. do any of the killing. They just did the covering it up. Okay, gotcha. I'm on track. So, and that's the end of it, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, that pretty according to the documents, that's where the story ends because there's a whole lot of different options for what happened to them, where they went, like, and everything. And it just became sort of a local leg- legend about the bloody benders. Right. And like, okay, so yeah, so we know that. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to deal, in my theory, I'm not going to deal with the women. Okay. Because, like, doesn't matter where they were, where they went, they couldn't have been tried anyway. Yeah. Like, they were caught and then let go. Yeah. So that's, uh, for me, that's, I mean, that's like, ah, oh, it's so mysterious. What happened to this guy that got acquitted of this crime? Who cares? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not what we're here to talk about. Yeah. But the two guys, remind me again, the younger one possibly cut his foot off right that would be the older one there are two options for like out of the theories for what happened to the older one either okay three theories either he went with ma bender to Mm. uh st louis missouri or he committed suicide in lake michigan okay or he ended up bleeding to death trying to escape arrest in salmon idaho okay yeah it's none of those (laughs) <laughs> um, and what, well, what, and the, the older guy or the, the young, the younger guy, the what only, was what? yeah, the only real theory about the younger guy was that he ran with Kate to a outlaw haven in between like Texas and, uh, New Mexico. Okay. I remember that, but Kate was with Ma, so that obviously didn't happen. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe she double backed or something. No, we're going to say that didn't happen. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> so we have absolutely no idea what's going on with him. Yeah. Okay. So here is my theory. The younger dude was some kind of devil. 
Okay. Hear me out. All right. Remember, he was very handsome and very charming and spoke very eloquently, uh, you were talking about. And uh, uh-huh. that's how he was able to help. Like, they had, they had summoned this devil to help them lure people in so that they could murder them. Or better yet, they had summoned him to help them with something. I don't know, like, hey, can you go till the garden? Because none of us want to do it. <laughs> and he was like, all right, but in return, you're going to kill a bunch of people for me. Because I'm a devil. What else would you f- expect from me? Uh-huh. And then when, you know, the police were on their trail and everything, he just f- straight up bounced and went went back to wherever he came from. From yeah. whence he came. Dun, back, dun, dun. To, back to Mount Mordor. I don't know. <laughs> Where all demons come from. Mount Mordor. Well, every time when someone says from whence something came, I just think of Elrond. Yeah. Saying that you have to, they have to take the ring and throw it in the fires of Mount Doom from whence it came. Dun, dun, dun. So that's what happened to him. Yeah. The other dude, he did not get caught in a trap. He did not saw his leg off. Okay. Uh, he didn't bleed out. He didn't go with Ma. He did go to Lake Michigan, though. Okay. And there he staged a suicide. Hmm, all right. But, <laughs> I know, uh, he staged this suicide to make it look like he had killed himself. And like they were like, all right, well, I guess, you know, we can't try him for this crime. And as soon as he was scot-free, he stepped out into traffic and got hit by a bus. (laughs) But there were no buses back then, Chad. You say, that is a minor technicality. This is what happened. He got hit by a horse. He was trampled. He was trampled. He wasn't paying attention. Stepped out into traffic and was trampled by a horse. So, I mean, he's... Justice was served, but just... Not the way we expected. In a very karma-like fashion. Yeah. So, okay. that's that's what I'm going with. All right, that's what you're going with? Well, mm-hmm. I gotta say that the one who summoned the devil had to have been Kate. Because she was a mysticist. Yeah. She was the one who was into the spiritualism and the arcane and the, and the free love, man. Because, you know, that's devil worship stuff. I thought that I had said that. Maybe I You, you said out. them in general. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah. it was a collective effort. Collective effort. But she was the one who, like, guided them through the process. Right, right, right. So that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, Thank you for validating my theory. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, it makes sense. Because where did he come from? Where did he go? Where did he come from, Cotton Eye Joe? No one knows. We, he just We vanished. use that joke way too much on this podcast. I love that joke. I make it all the time. It's going to continue having use. <laughs> it's been in at least four episodes now. <laughs> uh, practically a catchphrase. So what are, you, what are you thinking? I mean, other than agreeing with me wholeheartedly, <laughs> because it's obviously the only explanation for the, the younger guy. Obviously. Um, obviously. I mean... What about Pa? Pa Bander. Pa Bander. I mean, he could have gone crazy and just been like, because cause maybe he was, he didn't have many like rumors about him uh, from before <laughs> he met up with Elvira. Like it could be that Ma Bender, Elvira, was also a devil and she she just was a succubus because she had several husbands and like many children and she just used them up till they were dry and then killed them. Okay, and that's fair. She gathered up this group of people. Like her other children didn't want nothing to do with her, but she had one daughter who was a disciple of the demonic arts. Which is where she got her ability to summon lesser devils and whatnot. Yep, including John Jr. Jacobson, J- St. Jingle Heimerschmidt. <laughs> and she took him to be her husband because she's a half devil herself and everything. Right. And poor poor John Sr. was just this helpless sort of like immigrant guy, didn't know much English. He had a Bible that he, there were some things in it, like someday was like a slaughter day or something, but he was just dragged into this mess and he was corrupted by okay. the, the, de- the devils around him. And once he'd realized what he'd done and, like, how shit everything went, he went off on his own and tried to make it, couldn't, and eventually fell back into the old habit. And he didn't want to get caught, and so he just sort of sawed his leg off, because that's what you do when you're not entirely there and have no sense of self-preservation. You're saying he did saw his leg off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, you're wrong, but... um... (laughs) 
<laughs> Look, I know you have a PhD too, but I've had my yeah. longer, so. Oh, know. that's that. Yeah, that's true. You're the more senior, experienced one, but I'm I'm pretty sure that's how that went down. Not to mention, you are a feeble-minded woman, and I am a big, strong, smart, manly man. Oh well, uh, <laughs> if, that, if that's how it is. Oh well, then. <laughs> Just in case this bit makes it into the episode, I would like to clarify that I do not think that way. I actually believe that all things being equal, women are far superior mentally to men. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. Like, I know a lot of women that I'm smarter than, but I also know way more women that are smarter than me. <laughs> so. I, I think that all things considered equal, we're about equal there. So I think we're, we are in uh, agreement upon what happened to the women. What was going on with the women? Yeah. And what happened to the younger dude? We disagree on the old man. Yeah. But whatever. We're, we're not always going to agree. We didn't agree last time. Which is fair. <laughs> I mean, you have a PhD the same as I do. Your opinion is just as valid. So that wraps that up. Um, so we do want to mention uh, the Patreon again. The outtakes from last week's episode. We decided to go ahead and do it a little bit earlier. The outtakes from last week's episode, by the time you're hearing this, should be up on the Patreon. And the bonus episode should be up within a week or two. Yep, have some faith in me. <laughs> I, I mean, that's, I do. I, I was I was getting my timeline wrong, like because it's probably like two weeks from now. Yeah, but, a week after the episode gets uploaded. Yeah, by the time you're hearing this, within at least a week, the bonus episode will be up. Mm-hmm. And and maybe I'll have some more music tracks other than just like those ten. Also, we want to announce a, a little contest. I ordered some bumper stickers just to give to friends and whatnot, and ordered too many because they were cheaper in bulk. So we have five bumper stickers to give away. From the time that this episode airs, you will have two weeks to enter, and then we will pick five people at random. And the way you enter is go to iTunes, leave us a review. Like, all jokes aside, it doesn't have to be a five-star review. Just leave a review and a rating, and then send a screenshot to mysteriessolvedpodcast at gmail.com or as a DM on Twitter at UMS underscore podcast. The only reason we ask that you prove that you did it is because tracking reviews on iTunes is a f***ing nightmare. You have to go by country. So just, you know, leave a review and a rating, take a quick screenshot, send that either to the email or DM on Twitter. And then on the 19th, we will announce the uh, five winners information and send them out to you and anything else before we end this before i give my full spiel and get out of here uh no nothing that's on my mind okay well in the meantime again that email address if you want to send us a, a mystery that you would like us to solve is mysteries solved podcast all one word at gmail.com you can find us on Twitter at UMS underscore podcast, on Facebook at Unsolved Mysteries Solved. The Patreon is also Unsolved Mysteries Solved, or you can contact us through the Discord server or Facebook group. Plenty of ways to get a hold of us. And let's see if Cassandra can get it right this time. How do we end the show? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Don't question us, or... Don't question us, or you will be put down. Thank you. Woo! My mind is like a steel sieve. Everything (laughs) falls through the cracks. (laughs) My mind is like a bucket without a bottom. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, we will see you right back here next week with a brand new mystery. And uh, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We'll see you then, guys. Shut up, guys. This is why I don't do these things in person. (laughs) Do you often find that you need a distraction from everyday life? Do you like true crime, conspiracy theories, paranormal stories, and other weird, dark tales? Well, tune in and turn up Weird Distractions Podcast, where we, your hosts, Christy and Alex, bring you a weird distraction to help you get through the work week. Every Sunday morning, you can find our show on Apple Podcasts, Anchor, Spotify, Good Pods, and more. So, grab a snack, get comfy, and make sure to lock those doors. Need a distraction? We got you.